Hi, my name is Sharon Chen. I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Stanford University. In this video, I'll discuss the main protozoa, Entamoeba histolytica, that causes inflammatory diarrhea. The learning objective is to describe the clinical manifestations, diagnosis, treatment, and pathogenesis of amoebic dysentery. Entamoeba histolytica infects the colon, as you can see from the summary table. Entamoeba histolytica are single-celled organisms as you can see in the picture, the shape of an entamoeba is not defined. Here's a movie of entamoeba crawling around. The name comes from the Greek word meaning to change. They move by extending pseudopodia, and you can see small vacuoles inside. They use these for digesting their prey, which are usually bacteria in the colon, but they can also eat you. Amoebiasis is the name of the disease, and it's very prevalent in, the developing, in developing countries. It's estimated that 10% of humans are infected. That's about 500 million people. Of those, 90% are asymptomatic and only 10% will develop disease. It causes about 40,000 deaths per year worldwide. In fact, it's the second leading cause of death from parasites. The main risk factor is contamination of food and water with human waste. In some places, this contamination is a result of poor sanitation. In other places, it's because human waste is used as fertilizer for crops. Transmission is primarily fecal-oral from human to human. You can imagine infection is easy to get if you are playing next to an open sewer like this child in the picture. As with other diarrhea, incidence is higher in children compared to adults and is worse, worse in malnourished children. Overcrowding, especially in institutions, are also risk factors. In developed countries, amoebiasis is often seen in immigrants coming from endemic areas. Amoebiasis is also a potential disease from anal sex in men who have sex with men. Amoebiasis can result in both intestinal disease and extra-intestinal complications. It's a blood, bloody diarrhea due to colonic ulcers, and you can see this in the histology image. The normal glands are interrupted by the shallow ulcer that extends into the submucosa. If amoeba seeds systemic sites, they can cause extra intestinal complications. The most common is a liver abscess. You can see an abscess in this gross pathology of the liver. Unlike bacterial liver abscesses where pus is seen, the material within an amoebic abscess is a brown fluid looking like anchovy paste. It consists predominantly of necrotic hepatocytes. These abscesses can also extend across the diaphragm, causing a pleural collection. In rare cases, entamoeba can cause brain abscesses. Intestinal disease is known as amoebic colitis or dysentery. It presents with bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain, and fever that is slow to develop over a period of weeks, in contrast to days that you might see with bacteria infections. Local complications of these ulcers in the colon would be perforation of the colon with bowel necrosis and potential seeding of bacteria into the peritoneum, causing peritonitis. This is what kills people. How do you diagnose amoebiasis? Traditionally, it was done by microscopy of the stool looking for the cysts or trophozoite of the amoeba. However, microscopy is not so easy because entamoeba histolytica has to be distinguished from several harmless commensals that live in the colon but don't cause disease. In fact, I often get called by physicians that send stool tests and receive reports that their patient has entamoeba coli or entamoeba dispar or endolimax nana and are very concerned. All of these are commensals and not pathogens. One characteristic of entamoeba histolytica is that it tends to ingest erythrocytes. In the bottom picture, entamoeba histolytica trophozoite has red blood cells inside it. Today, we have more sophisticated molecular tests to detect entamoeba histolytica infections. For example, there are antigen tests using monoclonal antibody tests that rapidly make the diagnosis. Another emerging test is the use of PCR, which is sensitive and specific, but not yet available widely. When one is considering the differential diagnosis of inflammatory diarrhea, you should get stool bacterial cultures to look for bacteria. This will not find the amoeba. How do you treat amoebiasis? This first line, the first line drug is metronidazole. <clears throat> you might remember this drug is for treating anaerobic bacteria. So why would an antibacterial drug work on a protozoa? Metronidazole is a prodrug that's activated in low oxygen conditions. It can then damage the DNA in the microbe. 
Our cells utilize oxygen through mitochondria, so metronidazole can't be activated. It turns out that Entamoeba histolytica lack functional mitochondria because they lost them during early evolution. So metronidazole can be activated in Entamoeba histolytica. It's effective at killing trophozoites that live in the mucosa. A second luminal agent is also used because it kills cysts. Metronidazole has some activity against cysts, but not enough to eradicate them. The second drug is paramomycin. It's an aminoglycoside, like gentamicin. It's not absorbed across cell membranes, so when you give it orally, it achieves high concentrations in the lumen of the gut, but doesn't get absorbed. So how does Entamoeba histolytica cause disease? Well, if we go back to our framework, the pathogen has to enter and colonize and persist in the right environment. Entamoeba histolytica enters and exits the human host as cysts. These are very resistant and last days to weeks in the environment. They are not destroyed by the acid in the stomach. And when the cysts reach the small intestine, the bile acids serve as a cue to induce the production of proteolytic enzymes that digest the cyst wall from the inside. In the movie, you can see an amoebic cyst where the cyst wall is labeled in blue and the parasite digests the cell wall to emerge from the cyst. Out of each cyst, eight trophozoites emerge and then they migrate to the large intestine and colonize the colon. The top picture shows you a cyst that can be seen in a patient's stool. In the colon is where trophozoites colonize and persist. They don't necessarily cause disease. Remember, 90% of people are asymptomatic. The trophozoites live in the mucus layer during this asymptomatic time period. They mostly eat bacteria and dead epithelial cells. The mucus coat is made of sugars that can bind to lectins on the amoeba surface, which prevent them from binding to the epithelial cell. Now, it's not understood why they transition into being invasive. Some theories include starvation, low iron, or changes in the microbiota. But when the amoeba become invasive, they start to produce proteases that degrade the mucus layer, which then brings them in closer contact with the epithelial surface. The amoeba then crawl on the surface of the enterocyte, and they attach to the cell mainly via a lectin on the amoeba that binds to sugar residues on host glycoproteins. Even before invading, amoeba can nibble pieces of live cells without killing the cell. As you can see in the movie, amoeba is labeled in blue, and they were added to a mouse colon labeled in green. You can see the amoeba crawling between the crypts and nibbling little pieces of cell, which then appear as green pieces inside the amoeba. It's thought that as amoeba become more invasive, they secrete enzymes that cause epithelial cells to die. The adhesion of amoeba to the epithelium and the destruction of epithelium leads to cytokine and chemokine secretions like IL-8, which recruit neutrophils to the site, triggering inflammation. As amoeba invade into deeper tissues, they cause damage to blood vessels causing the blood in the stools. And amoeba histolytica can engulf these red blood cells and red blood cell fragments. The movie shows entamoeba histolytica ingesting red blood cells that were labeled green. Invasion deeper into the blood vessels can then lead to transport through the portal circulation where they can survive and produce liver abscesses, as I've already mentioned.